Hi there, fair maidens. Before we start with the teaching today, I would just like to mention that Father has blessed us with um, helping us to branch out a bit more to the Spanish community. We have a lady that um, Father has brought on our path that we've prayed for um, and confirmed it that she is to do um, the translations of the teachings and uh, different posts that we have on the website in Spanish also to do the transcripts in Spanish at, as well so this is a slow progress because she has to catch up with where we are at and she is on fire to do it and very excited so the teaching that we have at the moment that is translated um, into Spanish and also has a video in Spanish is um, the teaching called prayer and so if you have any friends that are Spanish and that you know you want to bless them with this then you can just go to our website go on to yesfairmaidens.com and go onto the teachings page and look for prayer and you will find all the material that you need there so I just give father all the praise and honor for what he is doing I sense it necessary to pray before we start today's teaching. So let's pray. Father, thank you for this message that is birth not of man, but of your spirit. Father, you know how burdened I was in putting this together, knowing that there is a finality and an Im imminence to this word that should not be ignored. Arrest our attention, Father, to give a due diligence to search the scriptures for ourselves as good Bereans, and to most importantly, hear what it is that you are saying to us personally. Give us the grace, Father, to not deal lightly with what you say in this message. Father, bind the fowls of the air wanting to steal the seed of this word to prevent it from taking root. We humble ourselves before you, Father, to receive only that which is of your spirit. Speak, Father. We are listening. Amen. We read the following in Matthew 4, verse 3 and 4. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The temptation was to live from the natural, being bread, or to live from the spiritual, being every word that God speaks to him. Will you live to fulfill the desire of the flesh, or will you live to fulfill the desire of the spirit? From whose mouth will you live? And clearly you can see the element of faith when we live from the words that he speaks. And this requires that he has given you a learned ear to know what to speak in a given time and to be guided by the spirit, not just the written word, but when he speaks to your spirit. As you mature in him and you become more sensitive to the spirit's promptings, you will note that his voice becomes softer and your discernment more acute. What also changes in the way he speaks to us, and depending on our maturity in him, as well as the office you are in, should you be in one of the fivefold ministries, is a greater requirement and cost. So I will be discussing this as well in this teaching, as the word makes it clear, that those who teach and are shepherds over his flock will be held to a greater accountability. Greater responsibility and power bears with it greater accountability. Now stones play a very significant role in scripture and how have different symbolic meanings. So we will be discussing these different meanings and will focus on the prophetic meaning during the tribulation as well to its personal application in our own lives. I write through this teaching the focus is ultimately from which source we choose to live. 
I talk about different dreams in this teaching, some from years ago and some brought to me for interpretation during the making of the teaching. And none of these dreams are by accident or just a fluke. He is the author of them. Now, the first meaning of stones I want to address is that of judgment. Stoning is something that happened a lot in scripture and it still happens in certain parts of the world. When Moses came down from the mountain after receiving the stone tablets from God, written by his finger, he found the Israelites dancing naked and very much unashamed around a golden calf. In a rage, Moses threw the stone tablets down and they broke, which served as a prophetic act of how they have broken the law. Now the casting down of the stones are in fact the judgment. When someone transgressed according to certain rules of the law, they were stoned. When Stephen, the first martyr in the New Testament, was stoned, it was because he transgressed the law. At the same time, we have Yeshua in John 8 being questioned by the Pharisees about whether he would stone the woman caught in adultery according to the law. And his reply to them was that he who is without sin may cast the first stone. And we know the rest of the story is that they all turned away. The one who could cast the first stone was him. He was blameless. However, in this teaching, I will show you through scripture how his blameless ones will cast stones in the time to come during the tribulation, which is a reference to speaking judgment. This will be delegated authority and the anointing that will rest upon those who are in authority over the church, which are those who are the true apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists and pastors. They represent the pillars of the faith and are all function in a shepherding context within their office. I said before, with great authority comes great cost and also great accountability. Now, being in the prophetic office, Father has through the years made it clear to me that not only are the words he gives me prophetic, but so also is my life. My life itself is the message or a sign. This is not the same with the other offices. Every office of the fivefold ministry has its own requirement and how he causes those in these offices to walk in their calling authentically. So what I mean is that he takes me through various things in order to speak from a place of authenticity and authority that he delegated to me. Not only does he speak to me through dreams and visions, but also through what he subjects me to in order to bring a message to you. And at times this requires me to share some personal information about myself, which I'm obviously not always too keen about. But when he confirms it to me, then I have to be obedient and transparent. So approximately three years ago, my twin brother came to my house and having printed out my teaching, said that I am a false teacher and many other things. And before this, I received three dreams from Father a year in advance that I would be attacked and falsely accused by him. I was to be silent during this time and not speak one word to defend myself. However, Father did give me one sentence to say. In the end, everybody's work will be tested with fire. Now, after my brother spoke to me, he went to my mother downstairs to speak to her. And she told me afterwards that when he walked into a flat, the first thing he said to her was, I know where you are going. You are going to heaven. However, he told her that I am going straight to hell. My mom told me that she was shocked by how much in hatred he said this. And whilst I was outside during this conversation he had with my mother, and unbeknownst to me what he was saying to her, I had a quick vision about him. I saw a pocket watch fall to the ground, and when it hit the ground, it broke open and all the pieces inside broke and scattered to the ground. Immediately the Spirit said to me, Unless he repents and turns to my word, as this pocket watch, he will fall to the ground and his life and purposes I had for him will scatter. 
I did not tell him about this. So after he spoke to my mother, they both came upstairs and we sat together eating a meal. Little did I know how he just condemned me to hell and then came to sit and meal, eat a meal at our table. After a few days, Father required of me to give him the word of judgment he gave me with regard to the pocket watch falling. And do not for one moment think that that was easy. I love my twin brother dearly. And since then, I've not seen or spoken to him again. The years passed and my brother wrote me off for not believing what he believes. And Father showed me in dreams that he would be deceived and he would deceive others with his teachings. And this was before I knew what he believed in. As the years passed, I could not help think that nothing really happened to him and that it was relatively going well with him. And I asked Father whether he was going to perform this judgment and he impressed it upon my heart that the pocket watch I saw also serves as an appointed time. It was not that I was eager for my judgment, or for the judgment of my own brother, but rather I understood from Father's dealings with me that his judgment is also a mercy in a way. Let me explain. Last year in December, Father guided me to fast for 16 days, specifically to pray for mercy for my brother and his wife, my sister and someone she knows. This he did by giving me a dream wherein they asked me why I am not fasting. So clearly I had to fast. And in this time, I cried in supplication for mercy for them who have turned from him. He made it clear that I was to pray for mercy as judgment is coming. Last week, I was led to read Psalm 109. And when I read it, I instantly knew that he was speaking to me about my brother. If you've listened to my teachings, you would understand that how he guided me in this is contrary to my personality and desire to show love and mercy. However, I do no longer live from bread, but from every word that he speaks to me, whether mercy or judgment. In Psalm 109, David, as the messianic figure of Christ, is speaking judgment over his enemies that come against him. He says the following from verse 1. Hold not thy peace, O God, of my praise, for the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful are opened against me. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue. They compass me about also with words of hatred and fought against me without a cause. For my love they are my adversaries, but I give myself unto prayer. And they have rewarded me evil for good and hatred for my love. Set thou a wicked man over him, and let Satan stand at his right hand. When he shall be judged, let him be condemned, and let his prayer become sin. Now David then continues to speak judgment over them, specifically cursing their children, even to the point that nobody will be able to help their children or wives. Let's go to verse 16. Because that he remembered not to show mercy, but persecuted the poor and needy man, that he might even slay the broken in heart. As he loved cursing, so let it come unto him. As he delighted not in blessing, so let it be far from him. As he clothed himself with cursing like as with his garment, so let it come into his bowels like water and like oil into his bones. Now I will refer to these bowels later as well. David was the one with the broken heart and given over to prayer for his enemies. However, the Spirit moved him to speak this judgment over his enemies. I read some commentaries about Psalm 109 and there is consensus that Psalm 109 refers to the judgment over Judas and his cursed children. David prays that Satan would stand at his enemy's right hand and this prophetically points to where Satan entered Judas whilst they were eating at the same table. In the same way, 
He who spoke a curse over my life, judging me to hell, and came to sit at my table and eat with me whilst I gave myself to pray for him, is a type and shadow of a Judas. Even when my brother left after the visit, he kissed me goodbye, and I remember how this felt fake. I have been betrayed by the one I love. I asked Father what it was that he wanted to show me through this psalm, knowing that he was talking to me about my brother. And I clearly heard him saying that I am to pray for judgment over my brother. He reminded me that he told me that he will show me things to come and that this judgment was one of them. Of course, I questioned whether I heard correctly as this seemed contrary to him asking me to fast for mercy in December. It was then that he said to me, During that time of fasting for mercy, I was extending my mercy to him, but the set time of judgment has come. This is not about what I want. It is about God allowing judgment in order to bring to repentance. If he did not desire to save him, he would not have asked me to pray for mercy. However, because mercy was scorned, now judgment will bring him to repentance. Now, Father reminded me of 2 Peter 2, speaking of the judgment on the false teachers and prophets who are not slumbering the judgment, and that it, is also, it also speaks of them being cursed children. And that's in the teaching called Pigs in the Parlor. I then fell to the ground and started crying. Then in obedience, I prayed for Father's judgment to come on him. And whilst doing so, I had a vision of a measuring line. It was then that the Spirit said to me, With the same measure he has meet out for you, the same measure will be meet out for him. And decided to look up the meaning of a measuring line in the Strong's Concordance, and it means to measure, but it also means a noose. And you will remember that Judas' end was that he hung himself. All these connections made me terribly sad, and the Spirit rebuked me, saying, It is not for all to speak my judgment over others, but rather it is given to my true prophets. For just as it is given for a prophet to cry for mercy, so it is also given to speak my judgment. However, when seeking mercy, it is the time to cry. But when you speak my judgment, you will not cry. He then reminded me of Ezekiel, a prophet who was told that he is a sign unto the nation that his wife would die and that he was not to shed a tear or mourn her death as a sign that God during Israel's judgment would not show mercy. In the same way, when this judgment comes, I am not to shed one tear. And I immediately stopped crying. This is the purpose of the judgment that will come upon this earth during the seals period of the tribulation. Because the sleeping church, the backslidden church, refuses to turn to him with their whole heart and mercy has been scorned. He will judge this world to bring them to repentance. It will be the last call to turn back to him. Matthew 7, we read from verse 2, For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye? And behold, a beam is in thy own eye. It is out of the abundance of the heart that we speak. And if there is guile to be found in your heart, it will come out of your mouth in some shape or form. It's best we allow him to deal with the beam in our eye, the eye a reference to the ability to discern, than to be so quick to speak a swift judgment. 
We know that scripture says that mercy triumphs over judgment. But let's read that in context. It's in James 2. And James is talking to the congregation about how they esteem the rich greater than the poor and that they are judging people. In John 7, 24, Yeshua says, Judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. In Isaiah 11, Isaiah prophesies about Yeshua saying, in verse 3 to 4, He shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither the reproof after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. In other words, he will not go by what he hears others say, or what he sees them do by appearances, but he will judge with righteous judgment, which is to live by the words that God speaks to him. From that he will judge. He will not go on his opinion or what he feels or anything other than what his father gives him to speak. This was true of his life as he clearly said that the words he speaks are the words he heard his father speak to him. And this is what it means to live by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Recently, one of my friends told me of someone who lives under the Torah who has judged someone to hell after she died from cancer, saying that it was because she did not follow the law and it was God's judgment on her. And to this, I want to say that this is very, a very dangerous thing to do. We have to remember, Yeshua said that he who is without sin may cast the first stone. You do not get to condemn people to hell because they do not agree with your opinion or fall in line with what you believe is true. It is not about what you believe, but whether he has indeed spoken to you. And if he has not spoken to you, it's best to sit down in class and shut your mouth. If you have not learned yet to shut your mouth when being judged by others, you do not get to speak his judgments. And if this is your portion, you will without a doubt first be judged by him so that every opinion, belief or tradition is brought into subjection to him. He alone is the source and he will not have you draw from the well of your opinions, traditions and beliefs operating from a religious spirit to condemn his children to hell. When a prophet speaks judgment, he speaks not his own judgment, but the judgment of God as the mouthpiece of God, and he and she or she does so with fear and trembling, knowing that his or her words will come to pass. This is a fearful thing. A few years ago, I had a vision of a man lying flat on his back. Suddenly, the vision zoomed to his mouth, and I saw that his mouth was filled with tiny white pebbles. The pebbles are referring to judging, and the man dead on the ground is to say that life and death is in the power of the tongue. James tells them, in James 2, that they are to live by the law of liberty. We do not live according to the law that enslaves, but the law given by Yeshua, which is to love God with all our heart, mind and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Hence, mercy triumphs over judgment, and those who refuse to show mercy will be judged without mercy. What a serious warning. Let's read that in James 2 from verse 12. So speak ye, and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty, the law of love. For he shall have judgment without mercy, that have showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. 
So with regard to my brother, I'm not saying that he will hang himself, but rather that should he not repent during this time of judgment, that things will really not go well with him. After my brother's initial visit, during which he condemned me to hell, I prayed continually for him. And one time, Father guided me to John 11, where Mary and Martha told Yeshua that if he had been there sooner, then their brother Lazarus would have lived. He told them the following, which was at that moment what he told me. Your brother is not dead. He is only asleep. I am the resurrection and the life. Instantly I knew that a death of a spiritual kind is inevitable for this resurrection, but that my brother will live. Father loves him and desires to bring him to repentance, even if it means utter destruction. And this too is the fate of Israel, the apple of his eye. Mercy triumphs over judgment, but sometimes judgment is the means to extend his mercy, just as it will be in the case of my brother. This morning I woke up from a broken heart, and it felt as if my heart was in a vice grip and someone was squeezing it. I was heartbroken and understood this to be his heart, father's heart, as this is not the first time that this has happened to me. He allows me to feel what he feels. This is very painful. The Spirit ministers to us during the night seasons as well. So I looked at the time and it was 5.13. And this is what it means in the Strong's Concordance. It means I rent, break asunder, I throw or dash down. To break, wreck or crack, especially to sunder by separation of the parts a shattering to minute fragments, but not a reduction to the constituent particles. In this, Father is referring to the vision I saw of the stopwatch falling to the ground and falling to pieces. So connecting this with the coming tribulation, let's look at the type and shadow of this judgment done through his pillars of faith, whom after the outpouring of the Spirit on those in the upper room came down from the upper room and started to prophesy and preach the word of God with great authority. Peter, whose name means stone or little rock, had an encounter with Ananias and Sapphira, who lied against the Spirit of God by only giving in part of the money they made off selling their land. Note, Peter's name means stone, And in this scripture, judgment comes from his mouth. This is a type and shadow of the judgment that will be spoken by the unction of the Holy Spirit through those appointed vessels for this very purpose, that those who see the judgment of God will fear God and repent. This judgment to speak is not given to all. Let's read that in Acts 5, and we're going to start from verse 3. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thy own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thy heart, that thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. And great fear came on all them that heard these things. And the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yes, for so much. And then Peter said unto her, How is it that you have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet, and yielded up the ghost, and the young men came in, and found her dead, and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. And great fear 
came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. And of the rest does no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. To magnify them is to esteem them highly. Verse 14. And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes both of men and women. As I often mention, Scripture tells us that which was shall be again. We are presently in the age of Laodicea, but once the tribulation begins, we will again start in the apostolic age of the church of Ephesus, where what was said to them and what they went through will be applicable to us. We will then go through the different churches as the tribulation progresses until we reach the Laodicean church again, just before his return to this earth. So please refer to our website page called End Times Foundations, where towards the end you will find a chart regarding the church ages done by ministry revealed. Let's look at what happened at Ephesus that connects us to stoning. In Acts 19.35, the secretary of the city of Ephesus speaks to a crowd who is angry with the Apostle Paul. The secretary tries to quieten the mob and he reminds them of the city's unique relationship with the goddess Artemis. The last phrase of this statement in verse 35 is translated into English in various ways. Let's read that. The secretary said, People of Ephesus, what person is there who doesn't know that the city of the Ephesians is the temple guardian of the great Artemis? Now, this refers to an object that was cast down from heaven, and it is the word diopetus, and is used with a particular sense. The word does not specify what the object is. It could be an image or statue or a stone, such as a meteorite. But the etymology of diopetus indicates that the object fell from Zeus, that is, it fell from the sky or heaven. Arthur Cook a British archaeologist and Zeus scholar described an artifact found at Smyrna that came from Ephesus. It was identified as a greenish sacred stone dated to 2000 BCE and similar to others thought to be endowed with life or to give access to a deity, most commonly Zeus. So he considered the possibility that the piece was the Zeus fallen image of Artemis Ephesia, noting, and all the more so when we learn that by an impressive coincidence, the pounder actually came from Ephesus. So I'm sure you are aware of the plethora of visions and dreams, not to mention the predictive programming on the different media platforms of an incoming stone coming to earth. Whether you believe in asteroids or meteorites or not, the point is that judgment of a severe kind is coming to this earth. In Luke 22, Yeshua is praying praying in Gethsemane. Let's read this, remembering that Luke refers to the bride, and that's the reason why you will not find the same wording in the other synoptic gospels. This scripture in Luke 22 is referring prophetically to the beginning of, of the tribulation. And that's in verse 39. Let's start there. And he came out and went as he was wont to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and kneeled down and prayed. This word stone in the Strong's is G3037 and it means a small stone or of building stones. It also means a stumbling stone. This is very important as we progress through this teaching. It also means a millstone, also connected to his little ones or guileless ones as a millstone speaking of judgment. 
against those who come against them, his workers. In Matthew 3, we have a reference to stones being symbolic of his children, remembering that the children of Abram are those who live by faith, regarded as true as Israelites, and that Peter is a reference to the church and that his name means stone. You can see how this refers to God's children being stones, living stones that live by faith, true children of Abram. Let's read that in Matthew 3 verse 9. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abram to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abram. Therefore, these words, a stone's cast in Luke 22, is not just merely showing distance, but in fact is speaking of being a short distance from judgment. The same goes for the word cast as it means to throw violently or intensely, to strike down and to thrust. After praying and finding them sleeping, he tells his disciples to watch him pray. And just after this incident where Yeshua is praying in the garden, Judas arrives, betraying him with a kiss. Now, I do not think this is a coincidence that Father is speaking to us about stones and Judas, Judas at all but rather that he who has ears will understand that judgment is indeed a stone's throw away. God is bringing judgment, and he will do it through his stones as well. We are those stones, as scripture tells us, that we are living stones built up in our high priest. We are the builders of the foundation of the church, building on the foundation that the apostles and prophets before us has laid. And then we are the wall builders as well. Now, I've referred in previous teachings of a dream where I'm building a wall with precious stones, whilst Yeshua is sitting behind me on his throne, the throne fixed in a completed foundation. The foundation builders are the seals workers, and the wall builders are the trumpets workers. In Mark 13, Yeshua speaks of not one stone remaining on another, referring to the destruction of Jerusalem at the beginning of the tribulation. So let's go to a scripture only mentioned in Luke. Once you understand the differences in the synoptic gospels and that God does not make mistakes, all these puzzle pieces will fall into place. Let's go to Luke 19, and we're going to start from verse 39. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hast known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong, belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thy eyes. For the day shall come upon thee that mine enemies, thine enemies, shall cast a trench about thee and can pass thee round and keep thee in on every side. And they shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Let's look at what it means for the stones to cry out. Now, in a normal conversation, that would, this would be a very strange thing to say, but nothing is by chance in Scripture. The context of this Scripture is that as Yeshua entered into Jerusalem, people were praising him, and the Pharisees, those who were to understand the day of their visitation, wanted him to silence his disciples. Note, he is weeping over the city that will see great destruction. The visitation of mercy was scorned and they rejected the master builder, the chief cornerstone of the temple. Therefore, destruction will come and being prophetic, his building stones, the worker bride, will declare judgment over them. Yeshua said that he will be as Jonah, a sign unto this generation. 
This was a prophetic statement of the tribulation, not of his death and resurrection. What did Jonah do? He declared judgment over Nineveh. And the word says that the queen of the south will rise with the men of Nineveh and judge this generation. This is the Jonah connection, Nineveh. So the queen of the south is the wife of the lamb and the virgins that follow her as per Psalm 45. And it's important that you listen to my teaching called the queen of the south for better understanding. I will place the link in the description box. Let's go to Luke 11 from verse 31 and read about this. The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. And the meaning of stone in this scripture is the same as mentioned before and it is the word lithos meaning building stones the stones that will be crying out and crying out has a significant meaning and it is not the popular view in saying that the children his children will praise him if they keep quiet no crying out is the word krazo and it means to croak like a raven to cry or pray for vengeance and speak with a loud voice. So I'm sure you can see the significance of what I've shared so far. I was to pray for vengeance or judgment. The raven is a reference to the Antichrist or Judas, a man filled with Satan, the son of perdition, who will come on the scene just after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit as per Acts 1 and 2, after which persecution of the church started. And we see the same in the account where Noah released a dove and a raven. First the outpouring of the Spirit and then the Antichrist starts to slowly come on the scene to bring peace after World War III breaks out. This is approximately 2.5 years into the tribulation, right when the Church of Smyrna will be applicable. And the mark of the beast will be introduced and made mandatory to sell and buy. Therefore, this crying out of the stones is the judgment not only coming on the earth, but the judgment that will come through those appointed such authority, just like the apostles. They are the stones that will cry out and pray for judgment. In Luke 22, those who continue with him in his temptations are told that they will one day be given cities to rule over and that they will judge the twelve tribes. These are the workers who will be raised up at the last day to rule and reign with him during the millennial. Paul also rebukes the Corinthians and he says to them in 1 Corinthians 6, Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? Also a few years ago he gave me an experience where I was sleeping and I woke up with one side of my mouth being ice cold and the other side very hot. It was then that he told me that unless I understand my call and buy into it wholeheartedly, having a mouth without guile, he cannot use me as his mouthpiece. Unless I truly understood my prophetic call, he cannot use me. This he had to work in me until I embraced it and understood that this is the call upon my life. It's not easy to give words of judgment and it should also never be. I was reminded of a word Father gave me in 2022 that speaks of his vengeance. And this is the word. It's called vengeance is mine and I received it on the 8th of November 2020. For those who continue in their sin, there is an eternal lake of fire preserved. 
but those who call upon me, those who repent of their sins, I will be as a father that snatches away his only child from the wrath to come. Fear not, my children, for I am for you and not against you. Those whom I have called are mine. I've called you by name and nobody will snatch you out of my hands. But woe to those who causes any of these little ones to fall. For it is better for them to be cast into the sea with a millstone around their neck. Seek me while there is still time. Who can prevent the hand of God in this coming hour? My vengeance is hot against those who refuse to turn and seek their own pleasure and serve their own hearts. Those who refuse to bow in humble submission to I am. I come, and with me I bring not mercy, but judgment and wrath. Have I not said I will have mercy upon whom I will have mercy? Yet mankind have scorned my mercy as one who scorns a vile thing. So I too will scorn them as a vile thing and say, Depart from me, I know you not. Even though so much time has passed, even though my prophets warned, still they hardened their heart and refused to repent. So I will not repent of my wrath, but pour it out on this earth as rain from the sky. Where mercy was daily poured forth, my wrath will come. The time to seek me and repent is now. Turn, turn, turn from your sins, for I am holy. In a time where I was to be found they did not seek me, and they will cry out, Why hast thou forsaken us, when it was they who have forsaken me? Vengeance is mine, and I will repay. Repent, and I will save you from the wrath to come. I believe this prophetic word is both for the seal's judgment and the trumpet's wrath in the tribulation. In Isaiah 58, he clothes himself with vengeance, wondering why there was no intercessor on behalf of those he is about to destroy. Are you praying for mercy? Now, so far, we've talked about how stones refer to judgment and that they represent also his children. I want us to focus now on a more personal level and what he is saying to us with regard to our mouths. Once again, he was faithful during the making of this teaching to bring dreams and experiences that speaks directly to this topic. All dreams of other people I share on any teachings are told with permission. So he gives these dreams and visions in order not only to give us context, as a picture or a dream or vision speaks a thousand words, but also as a witness that he indeed is the author of my speaking and that he decides the timing of it. This brings me to another symbolic meaning of stones, which is that of being a witness. Interesting that when we die, a stone is erected or a heap of stones are placed on top of each other. It serves as a witness. And you will remember that when Joshua crossed over the Jordan, stones were placed by each tribe in the Jordan to serve as a witness to what God has done for Israel. And these stones, or witnesses in the Jordan, are a reference to the 144,000 virgins that will follow the Lamb wheresoever He goes, as read in Revelation 14. They are the trumpet workers. Now, just as John the Baptist is a type and shadow of the witnesses of the greater light, Yeshua in the seals period, so there is another John group, the 144,000 virgins, in John 14 to 15. Just like John the Baptist is called the friend of the bridegroom, who serves as a witness to the wedding as well, so the 144,000 in John 15 are also called his friends. And John 15 speaks of the 
vine. And the vine being pressed or pruned is a reference to trumpets. So when you go into the meaning of the word friends in John 15, you will see that it means a witness, also a martyr. So clearly his friends are his witnesses and they are his stones built up in him through whom he will speak. In Genesis 31, when read with end time understanding, you will see a reference to the 144,000. Just after this incident in Genesis 32, Jacob wrestles with the angel of God, known as Jacob's struggle or trouble. Jacob's trouble is a reference to the trumpet spirit of the tribulation. So before trumpet starts, Revelation tells us of the 144,000 virgins or blameless ones. In Genesis 31, Laban, Jacob's father-in-law, pursues after Jacob because Jacob decided to flee with his two wives and their handmaidens, cattle and men. Laban wanted to at least say goodbye to his daughters and did not like that Jacob just ran away. Having caught up with Jacob and his company, they decided to enter into a covenant of peace and they did so by establishing witnesses. Okay, so let's read that in Genesis 31. Let's start with verse 44. Now therefore come thou, let us make a covenant, I and thou, and let it be for a witness between me and thee. And Jacob took a stone and set it up for a pillar. And Jacob said unto his brethren, Gather stones, plural. And they took stones and made a heap. And they did eat there upon the heap. And Laban called it Yegar Sahadathu. I hope I pronounced that correct. But Jacob called it Galit. And Yegar Shadutha, sorry, that's right, means a witness heap, meaning to testify. And Galit means also a witness heap, but refers to a spring, a fountain, or well. Note. A well is made of stones. So, verse 48, And Laban said, This heap is a witness between me and thee this day. Therefore was the name of it called Galit. And in verse 49, it says, It was also called Mizpah, for he said, The Lord watch between me and thee when we are absent one from another. And Mizpah means watchtower. Three names were given to these stones, and they together are to testify, to witness, and to be a well or spring, and to be a watchtower. All this points to the worker bride, but specifically in this scripture to the 144,000 virgins. Verse 50. If thou shalt afflict my daughters, or if thou shalt take other wives beside my daughters, no man is with us. See, God is witness between me and thee. And Laban said to Jacob, Behold this heap. And behold, this pillar, which I have cast between me and thee. And verse 52, this heap be witness, and this pillar be witness, that I will not pass over this heap to thee, and that thou shalt not pass over this heap and this pillar unto me for harm. Together we have a heap of stones, or witnesses, with a pillar. The pillar is a reference to Yeshua, and the stones are the 144,000 virgins following him. What I also find interesting is that the stones are for stumbling and the pillar is also a stump or stock, a reference to being the branch. Now pillars are the oaks of righteousness as well and it means to take a stand, to be established, appointed as deputy officer, foster father and mother. Yeshua is the stone the builders rejected, and these stones as witnesses will cry out the judgment over these builders. So approximately seven years ago, I prayed that he would fill me with his love. However, I was very specific in my prayer, and I believe this prayer was directed by the Spirit because he knew what he wanted to work in me. I pray that he would not just fill me with his love in a general sense, but that I wanted his love that transcends understanding that is the essence of him. In that moment, 
You said to me something I did not expect. He said, You do not know what you are asking. For this kind of love, you have to be willing to lay down your life. I said, I'm willing. And from that moment on, he worked in me his love by causing me to go through great trials resulting in me laying my life down. In John 15, he tells his disciples that no man has greater love than he who is willing to lay down his life for his friends. He tells them that they are no longer his servants, but he calls them his friends. They are his witnesses. In other words, his love and being a true witness is in inseparable and has everything to do with laying your life down for your friends. The word friends is also a covenant term and to those who are his friends, he reveals his covenant. David refers to this in Psalm 25 in the word secret and it refers to sharing with friends that are intimate with him, much like those sitting to dine with him at the table. John was so intimate with him, called the disciple whom Yeshua loved, that he laid his head on his bosom. Let's read that in Psalm 25 verse 14. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. To show them his covenant is to perform his covenant towards them. In John 13, Yeshua speaks to his disciples having taken off his outer garment, a reference to where Paul speaks of how he humbled himself in Philippians 2. He put on the garment of flesh, so to speak, and humbled himself to not only come in the form of a helpless child, but also to come in the form of a servant and obey God to the point of death. He tells his disciples, in John 13 verse 34, he says, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. Not only is this love a suffering love, but it is also a serving love. Yeshua is called the suffering servant. Washing someone's feet is to wash the tired feet of those who have gone out as his witnesses. This is one meaning of feet. Scripture tells us how good and how pleasant are the feet of those who bring good tidings. Before I started this teaching, a close friend of mine had a dream about me. And she often dreams about me and at times Father gives her dreams to warn me or to exhort me. And I'm thankful, of course, for this because he knows what lies ahead. About a year ago, she also had a dream of me wherein I told her that I am so busy that I do not even have time to play with my dog. And dogs in a dream is a reference to friends as well, depending on the context of the dream. Not having time to play with my dog is then a reference to not even having time for my friends. So also a few years back I had a dream where the emphasis was on persecution and I was surrounded by dogs. This reference to dogs was Father saying to me that he will give me the friends during this time. The Holy Spirit in this dream was sitting on my shoulder as a dove in royal blue colors representing priesthood and governmental authority. In other words, during this time I will need my friends. And Father showed me that I will be very busy in this year of 2024. So the following is my friend's dream and the interpretation which is also to exhort you. This is what she says. Um, that I invited her over to my house to come visit me. We lived on a farm and when she came to me, I was surprised to see her as I clean forgot that she was going to visit me. I told her that she needed to come another time, but she was adamant that she was going to stay. I was busy serving many people that were seated at tables and I briefly introduced them to her as my family. The whole time I was very busy and she started to talk to me, um, to my family. 
she then noticed that she could not really connect with them. And that was strange for her as she is one quick to join a conversation and connect with people. The next moment she saw me being very thin. What a nice thought. And I took out a packet of cigarettes wanting to smoke them. I then told her that I was experiencing so much stress that it's driving me to smoke. This dream was simply Father confirming once again that I will be very busy serving the family of God. However, I am not to lean on a crutch, the cigarettes, don't worry, I do not smoke, but that he was given me, he has given me friends to help me and be there for me. I am thin because of the stress. The reason why she could not relate to my family members is because he wanted to show a distinction between whom he called family and whom we call family. Proverbs 18.24 tells us that there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. We, having, we have a say that says blood is thicker than water. But in the case of those he has given me, his blood, not that of the natural family, speaks louder. This is why he said that we cannot be his disciples unless we are willing to forsake mother, brother, father, sister and friend. The friends given by him to minister to me and I to them as well are my family and I will need them in the time to come. We are to wash one another's feet. This may take up various forms to wash someone's feet, but the point is that in the time to come during the tribulation, we will be very busy. Just think of Paul and how the apostles went from house to house and city to city to spread the gospel. She even had a dream where I came to a house knowing that I'd been ministering and she was preparing food for me. She was delighted to serve me. To further illustrate my point, let's read Matthew 12 from verse 46. While ye, he yet talked to the people, Behold, his mother and his brethren stood without desiring to speak with him. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand towards his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. I praise Father for the friends he has given me and I will obey him and make time for my friends because we need each other now and we will need each other in the time to come. This is non-negotiable. So when last have you set time aside to pray for your friends? Not just a general prayer, but praying scripture over them and being specific. When last have you asked, Father, what scripture you can send to your friends to exhort or encourage them? The word says that a word fitly spoken is as an apple of gold in a setting of silver. Sometimes we need to hear encouragement coming from one another in order that we know that we are not alone. This is why we are to come together when possible in order to build one another up. Life is tough and he has given us each other to minister to which in turn is to minister to him i cannot imagine yeshua not having time for his disciples not long after this dream of my friend father started to speak to me about how he has made me into a pillar and a pillar is made out of stones and this reminded me then of Genesis 31 regarding the heap of stones and the pillar between Laban and Jacob that served as a witness to the covenant they made. As I mentioned, the word friends is a covenant term and we stand in covenant with each other. And that covenant is shown by how we love one another and lay our lives down for one another. Pillars in scripture and in the Strong's Concordance means foster fathers and mothers. They represent the fivefold ministry and those he is raising up as pillars to be mothers and fathers unto many of his children. 
That same day, we went out to the beach and sitting at a restaurant we did not intend to go to initially, I looked outside the window and saw stones built up together to make pillars. This is no coincidence. I myself am a pillar, but I consist of my children he has given me, whom I also consider my friends. As mentioned before, stones represent children. I also mentioned earlier the dream I had of building a wall with precious stones. So this is all a reference to Nehemiah, who was commissioned by the king to rebuild the broken walls of Jerusalem. Nehemiah was up against a lot, specifically conspiracies against him, those trying to deceive the king by bringing a bad report about him and also slandering and gossiping about Nehemiah and the work he did in rebuilding the walls. Right at the beginning of this teaching, I talked about how Yeshua said that man will not live from bread alone, but from every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The mouth is what he wants us to address. It is with our mouth that we witness. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. And we can either speak judgment, curses, condemnation, blessing, favor and love. Of course, whatever is of the spirit and of faith is eternal and will bring forth life. I want to share two dreams from one of the fair maidens because they are connected as well as an experience I had in which father confirmed the interpretation as well. And this is the dream. This lady said, I was coming and going out my front door and each time I would go, I was fine. But when I came back in, my left leg would be totally mangled and full of maggots. This happened a few times. As I woke up, I received the word, Dysentery. This is the interpretation. She went in and out of her front door. Often in dreams, a person is represented as a house, where windows would represent the eyes, the front door is the mouth. The word says that it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles, but rather that which comes out of the mouth. In other words, that which we speak, it goes out of the mouth, or your front door, defiles us on the inside. And so each time she came back into the house, her left leg was mangled and full of maggots. Where the right side represents strength, the left side represents weakness or flesh. And maggots are flesh-eating worms. So depending on the flesh will cause death to set in our walk. In other words, how you talk is affecting your house family, or the church as a house. To illustrate Father's faithfulness, another close friend of mine had an experience where she was suffering from extreme stomach pain to the point where she was bleeding. And she said that she ate something and when she ate it, she knew that she should not because she could sense her stomach reacting to it. I told her that this refers to what she puts into herself and not listening when the Spirit warns her. This she told me right before I read the above dream to give the interpretation. The definition of dysentery is a disease characterized by severe diarrhea with passage of mucus and blood from the bowels. At the same time of interpreting this dream, my other friend experienced it in reality in her body. I mentioned earlier whilst reading Psalm 109 that I will return back to the word bowels. That's in verse 18. David prayed of his enemy and said, As he clothed himself with cursing, like as with his garment, so let it come into his bowels like water and like oil into his bones. Ezekiel was told to eat the scroll and to allow it to enter into his bowels. In other words, his gut. And I told my friend that our gut or colon is considered our second brain of the body. This is important, as you will see with what he showed me afterwards, to serve as a witness to you of which father wants you to, to take note. So let's go to the next dream she had after the one about the mangled leg. 
In the stream, she says, a group of my friends, including Danny DeVito, came up to me and told me that I won a session of getting whipped. And I turned around to look at the whipping station behind me. It was a metal pole sticking out of the ground where a person would be tied by the hands to it while someone whipped them. My friend told me not to worry because he was used to the hard jump rope. There was a gradient of things to get whipped by and this boy had started from the beginning and went to the end and was also to the point where the whippings didn't bother him anymore. The hardest were by the hard plastic encased jump rope. Quickly, before it was my turn, I grabbed a thin whipping string and looped it and began whipping my own arm to try and get used to it before it would be done to me on my back. And this is the interpretation. Her friends are a reference to the John Company, the friends of the bridegroom, of who it is prophetically said that she would have to endure a whipping session. Danny DeVito is a reference to Daniel, which is to say to her that this is a prophetic dream stating what will be. Not just her, but also the friends of the bridegroom. Being whipped, according to Webster's Dictionary in slang, means if someone in a romantic relationship is whipped. They let their romantic partner have a great control over what they do and where they go. Guess who is the romantic partner telling her that she's about to be whipped? It is her bridegroom. The metal pole fixed in the ground speaks of something that is fixed and there is no getting out of this as she will be tied to it. She will have to endure. Her friend tells her that he is used to these hard jump ropes and she then realizes that there are gradients in means and difficulty in the whipping session of which the hardest is the plastic encased jumping ropes. However, her friend is no longer bothered by them anymore. The plastic jump ropes refers to those who are plastic or fake. In Isaiah 50 verse 6 we read that Yeshua gave his back to the smiters. To smite in the strongs is to be slain, beaten, to strike and wound. The back is one of the most sensitive areas of our body because of all the nerve endings connected to it. In other words, these plastic ropes, referring to those who are plastic or fake, hypocrites, will surely work on her nerves as they come against her. But she is to give her back to them and endure And be as Christ, silent as a lamb before its shearers. She has to endure the whipping. She then takes a thin whipping line and starts hitting her arm. This points to self-inflicting harm with what she says during this time. Also a reference to leaning on the arm of the flesh. This will defile her on the inside and her house. Now, just to illustrate how Father often speaks to me, I, at the same time, when I gave her this interpretation, was watching a series called Dr. John. I can only laugh. This series is about a doctor who has a serious illness himself, where his brain no longer gives his body the signals to tell him when he is in pain. He cannot feel pain. The part where I was in the series was where he had two patients under his care. The first one had the same illness as him, of the inability to feel pain. The other one felt extreme pain at the slightest touch. So I'm sure you can see the connection here. With the person having extreme pain at the slightest touch, they discovered that he contact, contracted shingles from his daughter who had chickenpox. Now in a nutshell, shingles is when your nerve endings are inflamed and it is very painful. I discussed earlier about judgment. And our Father will raise up those in authority to speak judgment in the time to come. In order to do so, He judges them first by taking them through many trials. This is what happened to me. And on one of these occasions, when He judged me, I went into a deep depression. And about three months afterwards, my body gave in because of the stress and I was in that I, because of what I was in before this judgment. So the doctor explained this to me as my body finally receiving the message from my brain that I no longer have to keep all the balls in the air and it gave in. The result was that I got shingles. 
I can only describe it as having raw flesh on your body and someone taking a grater and grating your flesh when something touches it even slightly. I could truly say you are working on my nerves. I tell you this to say that I know exactly how it feels to have shingles. And the morning after I gave the interpretation of this dream, I woke up in the middle of the night with my scalp extremely sensitive to the slightest touch. It felt exactly like shingles and I knew Father was trying to tell me something. Let's remember that we speak out of the abundance of our heart and that the word dysentery is connected to bowels, which as I said before, our bowels or colon is our second brain of the body. And his father was wanting to say that the renewing of the mind, the bowels, will affect what comes out of you. The word says that as man thinketh, so he is. The way you think, what is in your bowels will come out of your mouth, especially when you are whipped. You have to take Every thought captive and the only way to do so is to humble yourself and become silent during whipping sessions. This he is allowing in order to create endurance in us. These whipping sessions come in various forms of hardship. When Father told me that I will be going through a very difficult time this year, I set my mind and told myself, I deny myself the right to feel sorry for myself. I deny myself the right to moan. I deny myself the right to be oversensitive. And I deny myself to feel as a victim. I go into this whipping session knowing full well who the author is. Not to harm me, but to build me up for the time to come. It matters what I speak over others and myself in this time because unless I am resigned to suffer for him as he did for me, I will defile myself and those around me. And that is not an option. To this, Father kept on saying to me to live up to my name. My name is Petra and it comes from Peter and it means stone or rock. I used to be the queen of self-pity and I had ample reason to feel sorry for myself. I still do. However, his dealings with me have caused me to live up to my name, which is not only to endure under extreme hardship and abuse daily, but also to be able to speak judgment because he judged me as and has sanctified me. This was all a process and he is still causing me to endure greater things. I am whipped. Then he also calls me his Anna, his Joseph and his Benjamin. These are names that through various and multiple experiences and confirmations, he has shown me that I am these to him. And then he proceeded to work them all in me. Names are extremely important to God when it is given by him. In Revelations 2 verse 17 we read, He that have an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saying, He that receiveth it. This white stone is a stone given to those at the Olympics of that time that served as a token or ticket to come to the banquet of victors afterwards. We also, as his stones, receive names here on earth. Sometimes the names are Jacob, which means deceiver. But when we are willing to wrestle with God, he will give us a new name, Israel, which means to prevail against man and God. With every name he gives you, you have to wrestle with him to live up to your name. Are you living up to the meaning of your name? The Israelites could not enter into the land of promise because they were murmuring. This murmuring or self-pity or complaining was the equivalent of not having faith. God then sent snakes amongst them and many died before they could enter into Canaan. 
and you can only enter into his rest through faith. As said before, our mouths from which we live can either speak life or death. You can either speak death, condemning people to hell and death over your life, or you can be a well or spring of life. Proverbs 10, 11 says, The mouth of a righteous man is a well of life, but violence covereth the mouth of the wicked. What is coming out of your mouth? Are you even aware of how you speak? Are you a victim in your own eyes to your circumstances? Do you see his dealings with you in the light of what you need to deal with and consider it in the light of what you will deal with during the tribulation? Because let's face it, what we are facing now is small fry in comparison with being hunted down daily. We have to toughen up and resign ourselves to be whipped and be silent at the right time. He is the one to open your mouth to speak. Remembering that he said that they will know that we are his disciples by the way we love one another. Please receive this word he gave me on the 2nd of October 2022. It's called Love One Another. My children fight amongst each other as children in any household do. And just like earthly parents suffer the wounds of their children's pain, so do I. For I love my children as I love my own body. Nobody who loves himself harms himself but lays value of, on all his members. So there are many members in one body. But there is only one body. Did you know that? And yet my children do not see that just as they are a part of me, they are a part of one another. Did I not pray that they may be one as we are one? Is this not my earnest desire before my father in a time of such great deception? Yes, it's a time of great deception, but my children seek truth without love. Truth without love is as the letter without the spirit. The truth will set free, but when truth is not spoken in love, it hurts the body. It hurts me. The time you find yourself in is a time of removing the veil, the veil of deception. However, my children, do I not seek the fruit of a peaceable spirit that sows in peace? Is this how the world will know you? By how well you can show them their error? What good is there in knowing the truth, fighting for the truth, when your heart has grown cold? For everything there is a season and a time. Great wisdom is required for such a time of unveiling. Will you stand before me naked? Will you stand before me as the accuser as you accuse the members of my body? Love covers a multitude of sin and mercy triumphs over judgment. Therefore, Bind mercy and truth around your neck and walk in humility before me for I alone know all things and you only in part. Come to me first and hear of me before you speak. I desire that all would come to the truth, not just the truth of the letter but the truth of my spirit who I am. Are you covering your brothers and sisters in prayer or do you find yourself uncovering them before me? Will the world not then recognize you by the love you have for one another? Have you checked your fruit lately? I have. As the husbandman, I come soon to check fruit for my, from my garden, my plantings. Therefore, search your heart afresh, whether you are walking in love just as you desire to walk in truth. I've said that many hearts will grow cold and that there will be a famine in the land of the word. You are the epistles they read. Search your heart towards one another. Think not you can say you love me whom you cannot see, whilst hating your brother you can see. Lie not to yourself, but repent and seek that love my servant Paul spoke of above all things. Amen.